thank you all for coming. We have uh, quite a packed room. I'm uh, pleasantly impressed. So back in October and November, I was getting a lot of interviews from the press. Reporters were calling me and saying, you know, we see a lot of things that are happening in the commercial real estate arena. There are a lot of workers that are now working from home. They're not going back. Um, is that going to change? And the question I got the most was, what's going to happen to a lot of these retail centers, these malls, these shopping centers, where the major anchor stores, the department stores have closed and shuttered. And unfortunately, that is damaging the inline stores. And many of these malls are going under, going bankrupt. And what's that going to do to shopping? And more particularly, how is the Christmas season in 2021 going to look is what they were asking. Are shoppers going to come back and are they going to actually shop in the Christmas season at the bricks and mortar stores or is everybody going to go online? So Randy Workman called and said, hey, can you take some of that information and put it into a presentation for the 121 event this uh, spring? I said, absolutely. So I put together this great three and a half hour presentation about how we can handle this and how we can reposition all these properties. I said, I've got three and a half hours put together, Randy. He said, no problem, but you've got 45 minutes. So I'm going to talk very quickly. You're going to have to take copious notes. We'll try and cover as much as we can in as little time as possible. But again, what we're looking at is uncovering that hidden potential, how to win that commercial property listing by thinking outside the box, by looking through redevelopment, and repurposing property. So one of the questions I keep asking are, are we in a new commercial real estate era? As we enter this post-COVID period for commercial real estate, there are a lot of challenges that are facing commercial property owners. Office building vacancies are on the rise with employees working remotely from home. Retailers and bricks and mortar stores have seen a downturn and some of them are going out of business. So where does that leave the building owners? Today, we're gonna to talk about creating new value in tired properties, renovation, repurposing, releasing, or redeveloping. I don't use a lot of examples and case studies, and I don't wanna scare you up front because some of these are gonna be very, very large properties that I'm gonna to use to describe. And then some of them will be small, I'll bring it down to more of a local level. And hopefully you'll think outside of the box when advising clients and creating opportunities. And again, the difference between big properties like skyscrapers, when you redevelop those, and that small uh, multi-unit commercial property in downtown St. Louis or wherever you're trying to re redevelop something, the only actual difference is scale. It's the same idea, it's the same thought process. For those of you who don't know me, by the way, for those of you who have not participated in the ICRE training program, and if you haven't, please make sure to start that. I'm a professor of Lehigh University. Uh, Lehigh University, for those of you on the West Coast, is one of the top 50 schools in the country for many programs, including a lot of business and engineering programs. Awesome school. We're located about 90 minutes outside of Manhattan, about an hour north of Philadelphia. We've got a lot of old world charm, and we've got a lot of new technology. Because of our proximity to major cities like New York and Philadelphia and even Boston and DC, we're able to do some things that a lot of colleges can't. Like this is taking some of my students on top of a brand new skyscraper going up on Park Avenue in New York in Manhattan. We actually have many great students that have gone on to fabulous careers in real estate. In fact, if you're going to be a realtor who's selling or leasing major skyscrapers in major cities in the East Coast, you're probably going to a college like Harvard or NYU or uh, Lehigh University. And you're going through one of our programs, maybe Columbia. We're able to get uh, some of the top people in different aspects of commercial real estate, ownership, management, research, and sales. And again, some of our, our, our agents that graduated from our college are just incredible people. We're able to get them together for uh, workshops all over the place. These are some of our students, and uh, this is an event we did about two years ago. In the center, you're going to see Tara Stakem. Tara is one of the world's top real estate professionals, and she has leased buildings like the New World Trade Centers, been in charge of some of that space to be leased. Next to her is Mark Holiday, somebody I actually went to college with, and Mark is the uh, CEO of SL Green, the largest owner of skyscrapers in Manhattan. And even to this day, I mean, it's been a long time, but I can pick up the phone and call Mark's, you know, assistant. No, great guy. He has been valuable to our department. And all kidding aside, we've got students, former students from Lehigh that have sold over a billion dollars a year in real estate. How many of you would like to sell over a billion dollars in real estate in one year? How about a show of hands? All of us? Of course we would. So again, don't just think outside the box. 
I want you to think like there is no box. I want you to consider everything here as an opportunity to try and redesign something, redevelop it. Now, what's adding value? In my mind, adding value is one of two things, creating a higher return, a higher income stream right now, or creating a higher property value, and sometimes it's both, when you go to sell it by adding some value in. You're gonna realize that return now, or you're gonna realize that return when you sell. Now, some of you might raise your hand and say, well, you know, part of adding value is giving something back to society. And no, no, I'm looking for cash. I'm looking for where we're gonna create a higher return or a higher property value. There are a lot of ways to do it. On the screen you're gonna see behind me, you're gonna see repositioning, like remodeling and refreshing and, and making that space open. Adding value, adding different revenue streams like garages or rentals or something else, which we'll talk about. And changing the use. Everybody, how many of you have been in the real estate business for more than 20 years? Uh, show of hands. Quite a few of you. How many of you remember 20 years ago when we had all these downtown warehouses across the country that were sitting empty that we had to repurpose into residential apartments. Now we're seeing warehousing being one of the hottest topics out there. And we're converting in some cases, warehouses to self storage, but we're converting them uh, retail into medical and office. We're converting office buildings in some cities into hotels. We're converting hotels into assisted living. We're looking for that highest and best use. We're looking for the best return we can for that property, for that site, for that spot, and trying to repurpose that spot to give it its highest return, its highest value. And in some cases, if we're in downtown areas, if we're in areas where retail is struggling, maybe we have to look at trying to create some blended uses. So that's part of what we're doing. And then retail is trying to bring traffic back. What are we gonna do with all these big giant shopping centers, some of which are sitting empty? And sometimes we're, we're trying to convert them into mixed use sites with office, medical, and housing. Sometimes we're altering that destination use, trying to bring people in. And sometimes we're doing things like entertainment venues and pop-up stores, which we'll spend some time talking about. So when we look at repositioning, I'm gonna start with repositioning as a baseline to give you an idea. The simple solution is remodeling the space to bring it up to current standards. And again, I apologize for talking quickly, but again, we have a short time together today. Think about residential real estate. If you buy a colonial, a four bedroom, two and a half bath colonial built in the seventies, it has basically the same footprint as a colonial built a decade ago, right? Now, of course, it may not have the vaulted ceilings and it may not have the giant master bathroom, but setting those aside, the basic layout is fairly similar. So how do we maximize the value on a residential colonial if we're trying to sell it? Well, we repaint it, we replace the floor coverings, maybe we put in some laminate wood flooring instead of having old shag carpeting. We try and update the colors and the theme, and then we replace the kitchen. Because the kitchen is one of the focal points of the house, and it's one of the things you need to update, because some of them look pretty old. And over time, we have changed what we think is nice and modern in a house, particularly in a kitchen. Or you've got something in the late 60s that was very popular, and then in the 70s, good Lord, I don't know what they were thinking then. What's that flower pattern? I have no idea, and I don't understand it. And as we got into the late 70s, we had all these earth tones, and we had these yellows and browns, which were kind of hideous. But at the time, they were very popular, weren't they? Some of you lived through it. And then at some point, somebody thought it must be a good idea to put outside shingles or, or this into a kitchen. I can't believe that and brick behind it. Then for a long time, what was popular was putting in oak cabinets, raised panel oak cabinets, right? That was the standard everybody put in. And then we got into Corian countertops, solid surface countertops. They were nice, decent kitchens. Now, here's a kitchen that's probably 15, 18 years ago. And it was probably $80,000 when it was put in, in a high-end home. And as beautiful as this was for the time, if you're in a major market like San Francisco, you're going to get buyers and realtors who are gonna come in and take a look at this and say, oh no, what were they thinking? This is awful. We need to replace this. This is so dated. But it was a high-end kitchen at the time. Everybody is into grays and whites right now. That's what's popular. Granite countertops, white cabinets are very, very popular right now. And in some cases, there's a lot of emphasis going into different styles. Now, this is a very popular, very expensive kitchen today. 
but in 10 years, it likely won't be. So we're going to try and figure out how we take this and apply it to office buildings, to retail or, or commercial or office assets. So let's take a look at a couple of them. Now, this is gonna look like something most of you will ever never get involved in, but you never know. This is a project redeveloped by Mark Holiday, three Columbus Circle in Manhattan. They took a brick facade building, a class B asset, and they redid it. They replaced that brick facade with a glass curtain wall, a brand new lobby, created a two-story lobby with a backlit frosted glass walls, a brushed bronze wall accents, white marble floors, high-speed elevators. This $80 million renovation attracted trophy tenants. So whatever the tenants were paying that were in there, we replaced them. I shouldn't say we, but the owners of the building replaced them with higher paying trophy or investment grade tenants, including Nordstrom, Young and Rubicon and Chase Bank. And as a whole, Moody's rates 70% of these tenants as investment grade. And so that quality of a tenant is paramount to the longevity of the property and CRE industry. But the other thing that happens is not only are you creating a higher rental revenue, you're now able to trade that asset at a lower cap rate. Isn't that true? Because you've got a newer, a class A building that you're able now with, with uh, investment grade tenants. And this is what the back of the building looks like today. So here's another large property. This is one Madison place in New York. On the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a tall tower, great location, but you have very small windows. You don't have any outdoor space. And on the right, what they added, or we're in the process of adding, was another tower with creation of some outdoor space. That's glass. They were able to open up some of the building on the right to renovate it and change it. And it creates that outdoor space, that space that's going to attract high paying tenants. Because a lot of those tenants like that ability to have some place to go that isn't just in their cubicle in their office. And they'll pay more for that privilege, for that part of the project. Here's one of my favorite ones. This is a building redone by Robert Lapidus and LML Holding. This is a nice looking building, right? It's 425 Park Avenue, it overlooks Central Park and not a bad building at all. But here's what the front looks like. You can see those old green windows. You see a lot of masonry and it's a typical New York building. So how do we renovate and repurpose this? We turn it into something glass. We turn it into something that you can see through something that's going to be more updated. On the left-hand side, you see the building. And if you look carefully, you can see how the floors step back as you get further from the street uh, going uh, up, you see how they step back. He was able to turn some of that space, if you can see it on the right, into a mezzanine area that actually allows uh, some of the tenants to have some additional space to congregate uh, and enjoy the building, some asset that they were able to add value to and made all the windows or all the walls full glass curtain walls so you can see through them. Beautiful, beautiful building. And this is the mezzanine area that really attracts a lot of tenants. They're able to bring clients in, uh, meet with them. They're able to uh, have lunch. There are some outdoor areas. Now let's look at uh, a typical office space in a typical building like this. They have nice windows, they've got nice views, that's fine. Many of these buildings have these, but you're gonna see that they start somewhere around waist or chest levels where the windows actually start. Part of the reason for that is a lot of the utilities run through those areas. Sometimes they have uh, structural uh, components in them as well. In fact, in this next picture, you can see where the heating system on the right-hand side there is actually coming through the wall. And that's why um, the windows are the way they are. And this is a nice space. Please don't misunderstand me. Nice location. But what if we're able to take a space like this and convert it into something that looks like this. All glass walls overlooking the park. Beautiful, beautiful building when you're done. Look at the difference in flooring, look at the difference in the walls. And it's really the same space. Here's an upper floor looking out, and here's uh, some space looking through from office to office and taking advantage of those views. And again, here's a look at the mezzanine level, some outdoor space, some indoor space that they were able to create. And there's the outdoor space overlooking uh, the city. And again, here's me, by the way, on the right-hand side, standing next to uh, Robert Lapidus, developer here, and some of my students. So why do this? What's the purpose? What's the point? Why are we redeveloping a building like this? Well, let me ask you this. 
what is it that companies want when they're renting space in these major cities? Because I'm perfectly honest, if I'm in New York City, I can get cheaper space across the river in New Jersey. Not that it's inexpensive, but I can get cheaper space across the river in New Jersey. So what's the point in making space available in this area? Why do I need to be there? What am I trying to do? Same thing for Boston. I could be up in Concord. Same thing for DC. Same thing, I can be in Baltimore if I wanted to be. Same thing in Chicago and Miami and every other area. So why is it so critical to be in this space? The idea is that these companies want to attract the top clients and more important, not more importantly, but as important is the best talent. They want the best people that are going to be working for them. And they need to find a way to attract those people and differentiate themselves as a company from the other companies in the area that might hire that best talent. So we've got to have convenient space and we've got to have upscale space to attract those top employees and the clients we're trying to impress. And to do that, we need to have open space that they can redefine without being limited by columns. And what workers really are looking for is open space and they're looking for fresh air, air exchange, which is something that was built into this particular building. Now, these numbers are not real. I'm giving you a flavor of what happened. I can't give you actual numbers because I'd be in deep trouble. But let me give you a, a thought process about how something like this works. Let's say that this building costs $1,600 to put it together the way it is now. At 670,000 square feet, that amounts to about a billion dollars. I know that makes some of you very scared and most of you don't have that kind of pocket change. I think Randy does, but the rest of you probably don't. So a billion dollars. But let's say before that, it was running for 60 or $65 a square foot. And after this renovation, they're able to rent it for 120, 150, 200, $300 a square foot. If you're averaging $200 a square foot for this, not only do you have a much more significant return right now, but the value of the property is going to trade at probably a lower cap rate. And it's going to be, uh, it, let's say this works out to a $200 a square foot income. Let's say at a 4.5% cap rate, we're actually looking at a value now north of $2.5 billion, maybe $2.6 to $2.8 billion. Is it worth putting a billion into a building like this to create an asset worth 2.6, 2.7, 2.8 billion? Yeah, of course it is. That's what we're trying to do. Now let's bring it down a little bit, another level. And let's go to Denver, Colorado. Anybody here from Denver, Colorado? Anybody here from Colorado? We're pretty close to Colorado. All right, this is a historic building in downtown. It was repositioned to offer flexible floor plates to attract tech companies and creative companies in addition to those typical downtown financial firms and law firms. A lot of downtown areas are struggling to get tenants in a lot of these buildings. So how do we bring those tenants back in? What attracts them? What they did was redesign the ground floor to create this grand lobby with innovative food and retailer, uh, retail beverage, <laughs> beverage retailers, uh, some open space, some space to meet. They also were able to open the upstairs to remove a lot of those columns, to open it up so that people could redefine space, draw someone into this space because it's such an elegant look when you first walk in. This is called the vault. Here's another building, this is one of my favorite ones. This is in Los Angeles, it's a former post office. 400,000 square foot U.S. post office was built in 1971 with no windows. It's like that uh, Disney ride, no windows and no doors. So it was purchased for $46.5 million. And this is in Los Angeles. 30 million was invested to transform the property into a creative office campus. Now they looked at what's important to high paying tenants in the LA area. And oddly enough, they found that sand volleyball courts would attract tenants a dog park, a car wash, and a fitness center were all incorporated into this 400,000 square foot building and the surrounding property. They brought in tenants like TMZ, Microsoft, Sony, and Verizon, and the investor flipped the property in under four years for $316 million. Now, let me say that again. Invested 76.5 million, sold for 316 million. How many would like a return like that? Again, just trying to repurpose that building and reposition it. Now we've talked about remodeling, refreshing, opening it up. Let's talk a little bit about adding value. Take a look at some of the smaller properties we might be able to do that with. Here is a building that I used to own, or at least the tax map of it, in Whitehall, Pennsylvania. It uh, fronts on Front Street. Let's say it's two units. 
And in the back, it goes back to an alley, but there wasn't anything back there. Now I've gone to Google and tried to look up what the average cost in 2022 in the spring of a two bay garage is. It's between 19.6 and 28.2. So let's say 20 to 25,000 to add a two bay garage in the back along an alley. Now, what's the point of doing that? What's the purpose to this? So let's look at a spreadsheet. Now, if you haven't seen one of these, then you probably need to go back to the ICRE and learn everything again. But on the left-hand side, if the current income is 1,000 per unit per month, we've got 24,000 potential gross income a year. If we have expenses that are 10,200, which might be a little high for most of the country for this type of property, we've got a net income, NOI, of 13.8, trading at an 8% cap rate. And I know a lot of you are in lower cap rates for multi-units in parts of the country. Some of you are at 8%, some of you are at 10%, but a lot of the country is at five and six. But at an 8% cap rate, that building is worth 172.5. Now, if we add a two-car garage, two-bay garage, and we rent those bays for only $150 per bay per month. Now, some of you might think that's high, some low. But I want you to go look at self-storage units and try and look at a 200-square-foot self-storage unit and see what they actually rent for per square foot because they're renting currently for about $1.16 a square foot, which is a lot more than $150. It's more than double actually. So that adds another uh, $300 a month and our bottom line increases to 17.4. So we've increased our income currently. But if we apply an 8% cap rate, it adds $45,000 to the value of the property if we sold it. So a 20 or $25,000 investment adds 45,000 in value. That's something that we should do all day. It's a no brainer. But let's say we actually rented at a closer to normal rate in most of the country at $250 per bay. That adds 2,500 a month, which means that we're netting now 19.8, which at an 8% cap rate is 247.5. That added $75,000 in value by spending 20 or maybe 25 grand on a garage. That's adding values. So you're looking for opportunities. And by the way, it doesn't have to be just a two bay garage. There are places where we can add self storage units. There are places where we can add some sort of self storage and capacity that might add value to it. Let's look at warehouses. How do we add value to warehouses? If we can get away with it, sometimes we put a billboard on the roof, create some additional value with that billboard on the roof. Try and lease that back to a billboard company. If we can't put one on the roof, maybe we can put one on the side of a building. Try and generate an additional income stream that increases the value of that property that we can then turn around and sell it to an investor. We have a client right now who is actually putting these interior digital billboards in office buildings. And they're selling space on that digital billboard. They change uh, advertisers every 15 seconds or whatever it is. And they're able to revenue share back with the property owners. A little thing that adds a little bit of value. Cell towers. I'll tell you, we had a, a client who bought a horse boarding facility along a highway. 50 stalls, I believe, renting at about $350 a stall. So pretty good income property, but you have to have staff to actually run it. Along that stretch of highway, he was able to put in two double-sided billboards and a cell tower. Both of those items added significant value back into the property, significant income streams back into the property. And little things, you can even add in perhaps vending machines or something else into the building to add some additional value. For some of these spaces that are uh, sitting dormant at the moment, parking lots, uh, shopping center areas, maybe we can add some additional revenue streams like short-term or long-term parking for RVs. Lots of things we can do to try and add value. One other thing I want to talk about is co-working space. One of the hot topics these days, pro and con, is co-working space. Everybody's heard of WeWork, and everybody knows the problems, show of hands, everybody knows the problems that we've run into, uh, that WeWork ran into with some of their space, particularly through the pandemic. But the reality is there's a lot of empty office space sitting around the country, and we may be able to repurpose that space into co-working space and try and rent it. This is space where independent workers, including freelancers and entrepreneurs and startups, and remote workers might meet uh, independently in an office environment, and even allows them in some cases to socialize and collaborate. And sometimes we have some space set aside that we might be able to use for educational events or networking events. 
and co-working space can be leased as individual private offices, shared desks, or one of my favorites is dedicated memberships. Membership fees can be calculated by time or all sorts of different ways. So here's a couple of examples of what co-working space can look like in a former office. Some pretty interesting layouts. And they can be very profitable. Now, the key is to try and get them completely rented. So let's look at a 10,000 square foot office that's sitting dormant. Typically, the average employee takes about 151 square feet. So let's say we've got two conference rooms and 66 desks in this space, and we're, we typically would rent in this area for $18 a square foot with cam fees of three. So my net income on this space per year is 180,000. If I'm able to convert it over to co-working space, the average co-working workstation is only 80 square feet. Now, I don't wanna compress it that much. Instead of having 125 desks in the same space as 66 in traditional office, let's say we go to 80 desks, just a little bit more still having two conference rooms. And for every five desks, we might sell eight subscriptions because they're not all in there at the same time. That's an interesting concept. And we can sell them a little cheaper, but we get a broader number of people that are subscribing to become part of this community. At eight subscriptions per five desks at $300 a month, gives us 38,400 a month or 460,000 annually. Huge bump. Now there's added expense because managing this type of scenario takes some work, writing leases, canceling leases, turnover, getting new people in there. The additional part-time management, because I think you can do it on a part-time basis, might be 30,000 a year. You're also gonna increase your expenses because you're probably gonna be paying for uh, bathroom products, maybe you're offering coffee and tea and so on. So let's say the net income still is over $380,000 compared to $180,000 in a traditional model. Again, this is if we can get that space full, but there are some opportunities to generate some income. And by the way, we can create private offices, we can do dedicated desks, shared desks, flexible desks, uh, conference room rentals. We can rent social spaces at a discount for members. Private audio and video call cabins are very popular in the WeWork model. If you've seen these, they're pretty funny. They look like little phone booths with kind of a seat in them where you might have a phone, a phone call or a video call and have some privacy. They're these little phone booth-like things. We might rent lockers for storage. We might have mailboxes, computer or printer rentals, and we might have membership tiers. And we might do a desk for a day or a 10-day bundle. Lots of different options. In fact, we're selling a co-working building right now, and it's completely designed, it's a whole building, completely designed as wellness co-working space. Really interesting model. They've got therapists, they've got chiropractors, they've got massage in the building, they've got a yoga studio, and they've got a salt room. Anybody here know what a salt room is? And nobody? I didn't either. Apparently, you can get this pink salt from the Himalayas, fill a room with it, and people will actually pay you per 15 minutes or half hour or hour, whatever it is, to lay down on a blanket or sit in a chair and let the salt suck all the bad things out of you. So now I'm thinking about putting a salt room in all of our offices and renting it out on an hourly basis. Interesting concept though, but again, you can actually even position a co-working space at a particular target audience. Again, some of the challenges of co-working space is that it's management intense, that there's a heavy turnover and the landlord may be providing things like bathroom supplies, cleaning, coffee, tea, maybe snacks. And by the way, you have to provide access control so you don't have anybody and their brother wandering in and utilizing your space or doing something with it. So you need that access control. So let's go back again. Adding value is creating higher return for now or creating a higher property value in the long term. So let me have all of you shout this out or anybody who wants to. What cap rates are you seeing in your market for multifamily or for warehouses? Anybody? All right, where are you located? San Francisco, okay, your rates are very low. Where are you located? New Jersey, Maine? Okay, wide range of cap rates here, right? We're going from what, four to 10? So in our area, if I'm in uh, Jersey City, our firm covers Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. If I'm in Jersey City where the train goes into Manhattan, we're trading multifamily right now at about a four and a half percent cap rate. If I'm in Allentown in the city, it might be closer to an 8% cap rate. If I'm in the coal regions of Pennsylvania where there's not a significant amount of growth, some of them anyway, we might be trading at north of a 10% cap rate, maybe 11 or 12. 
because we don't have that growth. And again, part of it has to do with risk as well. What about triple net pharmacies? Those are very low cap rates. But on the other hand, we're seeing a higher cap rate for 1980s office space. Again, please keep in mind, cap rates and prices are inversely related. If I'm willing to, um, if I'm willing to buy this property at a low return, at a low cap rate, then I'm willing to pay more for the property. If I'm demanding a higher return, I want 10%, then I'm paying less for the property. And it's all based on my perceived risk. So if I'm buying a downtown office building or a 1980s strip mall or um, something like that, I'm going to be probably buying that at a higher cap rate and a lower price than perhaps um, a trophy tenant in a building that is going to be there for the next 30 years. So if we can alter the use, and again, property value is a function of the type of property, the location, the condition, and the strength of the tenants. So if we can alter that use, can we improve both the rental income and the value of the property based on changing the cap rate? Let me give you an example. Say we've got a fantastic corner property and we've got a Joe's Pizza there, a local version of Joe's Pizza. Now, I don't get me wrong, I love Joe's Pizza. It's huge, it's delicious, it's greasy, it's just fantastic. But the reality is it's a local retail tenant. So an investor is going to buy that at a higher cap rate. If I'm able to sell that lot, tear down that building, and have CVS or somebody like that, a pharmacy, a national pharmacy, Walgreens, put a pharmacy on that corner and lease it for the next 39 years, I'm probably going to get a higher rental rate. But more important than that, I'm also probably going to get a lower cap rate and that lower cap rate is going to generate a higher sales price on that property. That's an investment grade tenant versus a local tenant. Now here's an actual building. This is in Whitehall, Pennsylvania, not far from me, 1970 strip mall. And they have all national retail tenants. So they did at this point in time, a Radio Shack, which is now gone, of course, My Place Restaurant, Island. So these are, are uh, chains that are across the country. We've got a 1970s era, strip mall that was still in existence a few years ago. This was replaced, same footprint, same building, same exterior, actually they just reconfigured it, into a medical center that's owned by the major hospital system in that area. They're not going anywhere. So if I'm gonna turn around and, and sell that building, that project, because it's changed from a small retailer to medical office, I'm gonna sell it at a lower cap rate and then a higher sales price by altering that use of that property. Where there's disruption in the marketplace, there's also opportunity. Where there's pain, unfortunately pain, there's also opportunity that is created in that same space. And when we're looking at this, we wanna assess the potential for repositioning or redeveloping a property. We've gotta figure out what is it consumers in the area are looking for? What is it that we can put there that's going to do well? What voids exist in the community? Do we have something missing? Who are the potential tenants? What is the highest and best use of that site? And will the zoning allow us to make that change? Is the project financially feasible? Is it legally possible? And we have to be careful of those people around us that don't want anything changed in their backyard. And we also wanna look at easements and leases that may affect your ability to reposition or redevelop the property. Now, most of us in the country have zoning maps that tell us where things can go. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, most of the country, and I know places like Houston, Texas don't have zoning, but in most of the country, we have, they've separated anything commercial from anything industrial from anything residential. They don't want commercial anywhere near residential. We were trying to protect the houses and the value. The, that's created some problems for us as well. So every part of an area has a zone and that zone is based on what you can and can't put there. So we try and sometimes alter those uses. And part of what zoning does with us is it creates setbacks from the road we have to have, maximum heights we can go up, how much parking we might need. Like for example, in, a, in an area, we might have office space that might require five parking spots per thousand square feet or four parking spots per thousand square feet of retail or one parking spot per 1200 square foot apartment. And that dovetails into what we call maximum impervious coverage. 
So on a site, we have so much space we can use for building and parking lot. And we have to make sure we have enough parking for the building that we build. These are all restrictions that filter into a calculation to find out what we can put on a property. So for example, let's say we've got 100,000 square foot shopping center. That used to be um, a shopping center with a Sears in the middle or something else that's closed. <coughs> that 100,000 square foot shopping center in this particular area required five parking spaces per thousand square feet. 500 spaces times 300 square feet, that's how we calculate a parking lot, is 150,000 square feet of land over three acres just of parking. If in the same area, we're only required to have one spot per residential unit, maybe a 1200 square foot unit, we can shrink the amount of space that we actually need for parking on that property, which allows us to build more building. We might even build up. So let's say we take that 100,000 square foot footprint and we expand it. Let's say we change it to 300,000 square feet of space and maybe a three-story building or two, two-story building and we put in residential apartments. Are we gonna generate a lot more income for that same size site? Yeah, we are. You know, it's funny, uh, students that we have uh, participate in competitions. Villanova has a competition where they give you, uh, they give our students and a lot of students from other colleges a project. They hand it to them, you've got 24 or 48 hours to come up with the highest and best use you can for that property, put together a slideshow and turn it in and try and win prizes. And they might take a site where you can make retail or, or office or mixed use or uh, residential. And each one has different requirements, different restrictions, different coverage areas, and try and figure out what the highest and best use is and how you can maximize the return. Now you can run into problems too, because a lot of areas don't want you to change the use of the property. And we wanna look at how much value can be created by changing that use. The building you're seeing here is called the Dirkby Spice Plant. They closed many years ago, uh, another industrial building that unfortunately disappeared. But that site is at the crossroads of two major roads, and there's a, an interchange right next to it. You can see on the left-hand side, all housing. You can see on the right-hand side is actually uh, middle school. So probably the best use here is going to be retail. And that's what Lowe's thought. So Lowe's came in and bought this site thinking it would be very easy to convert it from a heavy industrial zone into a retail use. And after a couple of years of fighting with this particular city, they lost and they walked away and said, we can't, we can't make this work. So they sold it to a company called JG Petrucci who came back in. And the first thing he did was he went to all the neighbors on the uh, adjacent to the property and said, would you rather have an industrial site belching something in the air or would you rather have a shopping center and maybe some housing behind it? And of course, that's what they wanted. So he got all these neighbors to show up at the, the meeting wearing these bright yellow shirts that said, say yes to Lowe's and asked the city to allow him to change it to a, a shopping center. Now, let me explain something. Part of the problem is, particularly in the Northeast, so many uh, politicians want to see these high paying jobs coming back want to see all these people who are going to show up and or see these businesses show up and actually hire people again for industrial purposes, high paying union jobs. But the reality is they're probably not coming back because the truth is the restrictions and regulations in some parts of the country are really, really high. And the second part is the taxes are really high. And that's one of the main reasons or two of the main reasons that so many of these businesses end up overseas because they're able to put something up without the same kind of restrictions, the same type of time frame it takes to build them, the same type of uh, taxes that they're paying here. I always get a kick out of, uh, why are all the rich leaving California? Well, you're taxing them to death. We all have to pay our fair share. No, they really don't, they move to Texas. I apologize to those of you from California in the room. So what Petrucci did, was turn around to the city when they turned him down and said, no, we want this to be industrial. We want high paying jobs here. And he said, listen, your zoning allows me to put something else here. I don't remember what it was, but let's say it's a junkyard. I can put up 16 foot fences and I can pile a thousand cars in here and it'll smell bad and I can pile them pretty high and not hire anybody. And you can't do anything because it's an approved use in your zoning. I don't even need a permit. 
So I can do that. Or you can create some jobs, some income, some traffic, if we can, and some tax dollars, if we change this use over to retail. And they did. They allowed it to become a shopping center and then behind it at the lower part of the screen, that actually became an upscale apartment complex as well, which is more beneficial to the area. So how do we find these opportunities? How do we find the, the spot to put something if we're trying to look for what we need to, to create? <clears throat> this is a product called Business Analyst and Arc, through ArcGIS, which you can get through CCIM Institute. Now I know uh, many of you don't wanna go through the pain of getting a CCIM designation. By the way, I highly recommend you do it, but if you're not going to, you can still join CCIM. You can still join that. I think it's $650 a year and it gives you access to all their tools and their educational programs. So this particular one, Business Analyst, allows you to plot a point on a map where you think you're gonna locate some sort of business and then get it, demographics around it. Now the circles here you're seeing are um, radius of one mile, three miles and five miles. And then you're also seeing squiggly lines around and that is drive time within five minutes, 10 minutes and so on. Because we're trying to figure out who's in the area and whether or not they're going to buy whatever product we're trying to put there. If we're trying to position a dollar store or a liquor store or whatever, a gym, a, a fitness center, whatever we're trying to do, we wanna see whether or not it's going to work. And we can actually plot the retail demand uh, for that property, for that area, to figure out what'll work and what won't work. And there, these, there are these reports available that we're able to plot. This is called a gap analysis. See, in every part of the country, uh, there are gaps in what the demand is versus the supply of any product. So for example, uh, there may be a certain percentage of people who go out to eat every week, and there may not be as many restaurants in that area to cover it, or the alternative might happen, there's too much supply, too many restaurants in that area for the demand from the consumers. But if there's not enough supply, they drive out of their typical market area to get stuff someplace else. That can be for anything lawn and garden materials, uh, buying cars, buying jewelry, buying liquor. If you're doing, going to a liquor store, you don't want to go that far. If you want pizza, you're not going to go far to a pizza place. And the same thing with your fitness center. So we look for these gaps that exist. So we overlay those onto our map, and then we overlay traffic counts. And we try and put these maps together to try and figure out where the best place is to put the type of business we're trying to develop. Incidentally, in this uh, business analyst software, it also allows us to plot our competitors. So if I'm planning on opening a liquor store in this particular area of Texas, I can then uh, find all the other liquor stores by just searching it and have them uh, populate on the map and see if any of them are within that 10 minute drive time that I'm trying to find the demographics for. And incidentally, I can even decide I wanna look at four or five locations, pull all of them, get a five minute drive time around them and have the software pull up the demographics on them to see which areas have the largest population, which areas have the highest income, if that's important to whatever business we're putting in. And um, what kind of uh, population we have, do we have all senior citizens? Do we have all young families with kids? Do we have single uh, parents? Do we have uh, single people? And that'll help us to figure out whether or not this type of property is going to work, this type of use. That's called a suitability analysis. We put that together. And again, here's an example of picking several spots and trying to figure out what works for them. Now, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this because we don't have a lot of time, but we can also figure out everything about that area from what their education is, what the key facts are, and try and pull up what's called the tapestry segmentation. Awesome way of finding opportunities where we're gonna try and position the right type of use. So again, where there's disruption, there's opportunity. Let me segue over into some of these retail buildings and repurposing them. Here is a former department store. These are great big stores <coughs> that um, have gone dark. And these locations are often high traffic and high visibility. They're department stores. The locations typically have people with money because people are coming and shopping. And they generally have high ceilings and open floor plans. So this particular one, was converted, if you can see the lower right-hand side of the screen, was converted into uh, indoor self-storage. Great use for this. Great income coming in from it. Otherwise, it was sitting empty. Downtowns have been historically a real problem redeveloping space. Now, here we've got a three-story appliance store. 
great building, but there aren't a lot of people going to downtowns anymore to go to stores. Now, one of the reasons people don't come downtown is because it was easier, well, in this case, shop online, but it was easier to go to malls or shopping centers along the highway. So in this case, how do we bring people back down to the downtown? And how do we repurpose a building like this? Well, here's what it might look like. This is a, an example of what we might be doing. We might be converting it into something that has perhaps retail on the first floor, perhaps office on the second floor, and maybe five stories of apartments. And by the way, bringing office there means that we're generating jobs in the area. Bringing apartments there means that we're generating foot traffic for both the business, for the businesses in the area. And in this case, we're in what's called an NIZ zone, which is a opportunity zone, which has some incredible tax benefits. Another property in this NIZ zone, in this opportunity zone, is this one. Left-hand side is a scar shop. The right-hand side is a um, salon. And then there's uh, five apartments above these. Now, I've had dozens and dozens of calls over the last few weeks asking what the income and expenses are. And the reality is we're priced high for the income and expenses for a cap rate for a downtown property because the highest and best use is not what exists today. Let me show a different view of this. Next door is a site that's about the same size. And it had buildings about the same size that used to be there up until a year ago. They were torn down and what was put up in its place was 78 units of apartments with retail across the first floor. Now, can on the same size site, can you generate a whole lot more income from 78 apartment units plus retail? You can. And by the way, having all those units there, if you can actually fill them, which they did, if you can fill them, you're going to generate a lot of foot traffic, which actually helps the retail uses. And the way you bring people back to downtown is you give them something they want. You're looking for what the demographic is, what they want. In this case, they wanted something pet friendly. They created a library in the building. They have bike and personal storage. They've got a first floor lounge and coffee bar. They have resident lounge with a fireplace where people can uh, communicate together, a game lounge, some co-working space and some private meeting space, among other things. That's what attracted people to pay, frankly, double the uh, amount that a typical tenant would in that area and still bring them back into the downtown location. And again, repurposing the building to the right is tearing those down most likely and putting something similar up. One more example here is a Johnson Machine Factory with Bethlehem Steel. This is a, a building that produced a lot of equipment for World War II and of course sat dormant for a long period of time. Big, ugly building. Now this building was repurposed into uh, luxury condos or at least high-end condos. Tried to repurpose this. It's an adaptive reuse of a historic industrial building. And the redevelopment included um, creating several levels within this brick superstructure, including 171 condominiums, landscaped interior courtyards that feature industrial artifacts to pay homage to the building's history, and 50,000 square feet of commercial space, which included a restaurant and a fitness center, and something else is coming up, plus a 468 space parking garage. It's an urban infill redoing this building. Now, this is what the interior space looks like. They've created this interesting interior space where the units open inside. Again, they've got a lot of the steel from the old days built into it. And they have these nice common areas, this uh, uh, outside look inside the building. This is what a typical unit looks like. <coughs> and this is what the restaurant looked like. And they're in the process of putting in a public market, which is going to be added to this uh, property. Now, in order to make this work, they, they didn't cash flow at the original design to make this happen. So what they were able to do was do a public-private partnership and get the city to kick in, or the city and the county, to kick in by floating a bond, a few million dollars, in order to create that parking garage, which they are able to then generate some um, tax dollars from that building, they're able to reinvigorate uh, that downtown area, and they're able to rent some of those spaces to people in the, in the area to help create some revenue. So again, we talked about changing uses, repositioning, adding a value. Let's talk a little bit about repurposing retail. I know that's a big topic these days. 
Retail accounted for $471 million or 28% of the total US distressed asset sales in the fourth quarter of 2020. These are called zombie malls. And I can spend a lot of time going into why retail is failing, but I just don't have enough time. But I can tell you that downtown, downtowns became victims of shopping malls because of parking and weather and uh, convenience to highways all doomed a lot of the downtowns. And then malls became victims of lifestyle centers where you can stop and go in and out. And there's that ambiance and people love it. And then bricks and mortar retail has become a victim of online shopping and some other things. Anchor stores are destination uses and they tend to attract people to those inline stores. So you need to have the big uh, businesses there, the, the department stores to attract those consumers at foot traffic that brings everybody in. It's just like having a department store and you've got the checkout line and what people pick up in the checkout line. Now, even institutional investors are spending less and less, investing less and less <clears throat> in shopping centers, except the ones that are anchored by supermarkets because we're still gonna, of course, need groceries. So how do we repurpose them? This one is in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a former Borders bookstore, 25,000 square feet, and has been converted into a medical center with 18 exam rooms. This is a typical repurposing. Here's another one, I forget what this was, but it's been turned into an urgent care. And then we've got um, a shopping center in New York, this is New York Times, showing a Macy's, a Banana Republic, and then they've actually put a medical center in a nice corner location that at one point in time was a shopping district. Here's a medical um, construction design magazine out of the hospital into the mall, examining the retailization of healthcare. And here's a, an article that explains that right now, we, the modern approach to healthcare services is to bring it back into the communities, to decentralize it, to bring that back. And one of the ways to do that is to use some of these retail and office uses. And then some of these retail assets, unfortunately, we can't do anything with the building anymore. So we're gonna be selling it at the land value. And you're gonna to have to revalue it based on the price per acre, not on the price of the building as much as I hate to say it. Here's a, a shopping center, a mall, an interior mall, pretty large one, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. It's at the center of a couple of crossroads, uh, two highways, Route 22 and I-78. And the anchor stores were Sears, uh, Bonton. Bonton, by the way, was um, is like a, a regional Macy's that disappeared. Uh, J.C. Penney was the one up at the top. This is Antiques, and then a Kohl's. Three out of the four disappeared. Now, what happens when three of the four anchor stores shutter? Nobody comes to the mall and all the other stores start closing one after another. So what do we do with this piece of land, this big shopping center, this big mall at the crossroads of two highways? Well, in this case, it was repurposed. They've been tearing it down and changing it into a warehouse and distribution. And that's another possible use. What's it worth per acre as warehouse distribution space? So how do we bring shoppers back? In some cases, we're trying to, to fix these shopping centers, whether it's a strip mall or whether it's a shopping center or a major mall, how do we bring consumers back to these shopping centers if we don't have those anchor stores? So we've got to find other ways to do it, medical, fitness, entertainment, and something that has memberships. One of the uses is healthcare, medical centers or dental, that people will come to as a destination because they've got an appointment. One is fitness centers. Yes, many of us are sitting home on Peloton bikes, but the reality is that fitness centers bring people into the shopping center on a regular basis. Entertainment and sports venues are another way of bringing people in. Food and beverage is what people want to go out for. We're even seeing in some shopping centers, education, training centers, schools, which again is bringing foot traffic back in. Child care, uh, and what I'm going to talk about is pop up stores at the end. And we also want to create alternative reasons to be on the site, like creating mixed use sites, people living and working in the complex, adding multi family components to shopping and office components to shopping, adding hospitality or hotels and fulfillment centers all into that shopping mix to create that foot traffic. This is the King of Prussia Mall, one of the largest malls in the United States. 2.9 million square feet. And surrounding this mall is another 6 million square feet of retail. It's a huge uh, shopping mecca. Now, there have been some challenges lately. As fantastic as this mall is, Lord & Taylor has closed. 
And Lord & Taylor was 120,000 square foot retail store. So what do you do when something like that shutters? You can't find another user for 120,000 square foot building. Well, you repurpose it. In this case, they're repurposing it partly as office space and partly as co-working space. Again, to try and create this foot traffic one way or another. How many of you see mall rats? This is the granite run mall for mall rats. That has now been closed down, torn down parts of it. And uh, Bruce Toll from Toll Brothers has taken over this. Famous mall, unfortunately didn't make it because the department store shuttered. So how do we redo this re retail site and make it cash flow? In this case, what he did is he did build more retail space, but positioned it outward facing like a lifestyle center to draw people in, created a lot of restaurants and entertainment in the complex. We also added 400 luxury apartments. Again, foot traffic, creating people coming in, creating that mixed use. And by the way, a lot of communities won't allow this mixed use. It's something coming back that's relatively new for the first time in 50 years anyway, mixing those retail uses with office uses and with uh, residential uses as well, residential component. Anybody heard of the American Dream? It's a new shopping complex in Northern New Jersey. It has in it uh, DreamWorks Water Park, Nickelodeon uh, Theme Park, Mini Golf, Mirror Maze, um, Sea Life Aquarium, all this stuff, this entertainment stuff built into a shopping complex to create that foot traffic. This is actually a water park within the mall. Can you believe this? A water park like this within the mall. They also have a Nickelodeon uh, uh, theme park within the mall. And believe it or not, they've got indoor skiing in the mall. So again, this attracts people all year round to these entertainment venues that then filter out into the shopping. And they're able to rent these spaces and be able to repurpose some of this, these malls. Now, a lot of the shopping centers around the country have changed into outdoor shopping instead of interior, trying to uh, uh, repurpose them and face them outward whenever possible, trying to track people back. I want to finish up by talking a little bit about pop-up stores. We're trying to create foot traffic. So what happens when people are tired of the same old stores? Sometimes we can get some unique, interesting pop-up stores to show up in either retail or office places to create more foot traffic. And these are examples of pop-up stores. This is in front of a mall, an Adidas store that opens for you know, a couple of weeks that attracts people there. They advertise and bring people in. There's a Gucci in the mall that temporarily opens. We've got a Lolly shoe bar, whatever that is. We've got, I don't know what this is, but again, a pop-up store that shows up in a mall for a period of time, a Louis Vuitton. Uh, again, generating people stopping by because normally they can only buy this online if they're in certain areas. And they've got a temporary one there that might bring them back into the mall. I have no idea what kind of pop-up store this is, but it's horrifying and I would not go in there. Um, and then in front of office buildings, there's a pop-up deli that shows up. And here's one that sells cell phones in front of an office building. Again, creating some space you might be able to lease temporarily, generate some additional revenue. Here's GoPro. And at the same time as generating some additional revenue, we're also hopefully creating some of that foot traffic for the area. Here's Coca-Cola clothing uh, opening in an area. Now, again, we've just scratched the surface of repurposing commercial real estate. I only have 45 minutes. There's so much that's changing. We have to look at the opportunities and figure out what we're going to do to bring those consumers back and what we're going to do to try and reposition, repurpose, rebrand a space, any type of commercial space, and get the highest return we possibly can out of it. And again, please, don't just think outside the box. Think like there's no box at all. And I want to thank every one of you for coming today, and I'm going to be sticking around for questions afterwards.